In just a week or so, it's back to school again. But this will be a back to school like no other. Mandatory masks for children from grades 4 to 12. Physical distancing. Spending the day with the same group of students, also known as a cohort. Half days of in-person classes for high school students. And there's a very strong possibility that there'll be continued changes along the way as school officials respond to the evolving nature of the pandemic. Buckle up folks, it should be a wild ride. Hi everyone, I'm Trevor Sullivan from Sullivan Associates Clinical Psychology. Today I'm going to talk about how to prepare children and teens to return to school during the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we get started, I invite you to subscribe to this channel. And if you're on YouTube, click the alert notification. That way, when we release more videos like this, you'll get notified. As a general rule of thumb, most people don't like change. Or at the very least, change we don't get a say in or change we don't want. And since the middle of March of this year, there's been a boatload of both types of change. And if we as adults find change difficult, chances are good that your child or teen is going to find change just as difficult as well, especially if they already struggle with feelings of stress or anxiety. So today I'm going to talk about a six-step plan to help prepare children and teens to return to school. For my first step, I encourage you to prepare your child and teen for the changes that are coming. As I mentioned at the outset of this video, there are changes that we know about, but there are also likely to be more changes along the way. So not only is it important to encourage your child or teen to be flexible and patient, it's a good idea to open up their mind to change, as the general response to change is typically to be defensive and inflexible. So you're probably wondering, how do I open up my child's mind to change? I have kids, not parachutes. One way to help open up your child's mind to change is to use a self-affirmation exercise. A self-affirmation exercise involves encouraging your child or teen to think positively about the important things in their life. Or said another way, if I have to change and you want me to like it, there better be a good reason for it that's meaningful to me. In this case, an obvious focus would be to encourage your child to follow the changes at school to help prevent the spread of the virus to loved ones who are older or immune compromised. In a 2015 study by Dr. Emily Falk and colleagues, they found that having people do a self-affirmation exercise before doing something different they didn't want to do, they were more likely to engage in the desired activity. In this study, the goal was to get sedentary people who did enjoy exercising to exercise more. And what was particularly interesting in this study is that the participants were given brain scans and they all showed more activity in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is a fancy way to say that the reason they picked for making a change was meaningful to them, or there wouldn't have been increased activity in this area of the brain. So self-affirmation works, but the key in order for it to be effective is finding a reason for accepting change that's meaningful to your child or teen. For my second step, I encourage you to introduce your child or teen to mindfulness. Change creates stress. Even if your child doesn't experience difficulties in this area, there are bound to be some strong emotions at the start of the school year. Just a few thoughts that come to mind are the different look of the classroom, the different look of their teacher when they're wearing personal protective equipment, frustration with wearing a mask, the frustration of trying to understand what someone's saying when they're wearing a mask, the feeling of loss about not seeing other friends outside of their cohort, the frustration with physical distancing, and feeling anxious about all the changes in general. So one way to help cope with these feelings is to use mindfulness. In a 2016 study by Dr. Yan Lee Lin and colleagues, they asked study participants to meditate and then look at a series of upsetting images afterwards. Results show that people were able to better manage their emotions when they used mindfulness first. And also of interest, the researchers found that people who were meditating for the first time were able to control their emotions just as well as those who were naturally mindful. For those of you unfamiliar with mindfulness meditation, it involves paying attention to your thoughts, feelings, and sensations in the moment. Now, to be fair, to use mindfulness in the classroom, it'll take a little modification. So I'd suggest passing on the following steps to your child or teen. First, encourage them to simply make a point of taking slow, deep breaths from their stomach. And these breaths shouldn't be so deep that other students can tell that they're doing it. Second, encourage them to focus on being present by taking notice of their surroundings. This could be a focus on breathing from their belly, feeling their feet in the ground, or feeling their back against the chair. For those of you who've experienced with mindfulness, we're going to modify the third step, which is the thought component. Typically, the goal is to avoid engaging with your thoughts, and to treat yourself talk like thought bubbles 
that are just floating by, which is a good plan to follow. But if your child or teen zones out entirely, you won't be able to focus on what their teacher's saying. And I suspect that telling their teacher that Trevor Sullivan told me to treat all the incoming information like thought bubbles that I should just ignore and watch float by probably isn't going to go over too well with their teacher. So for this step, I'd suggest encouraging your child to do their best to lock on to what their teacher's saying while also slowing down their breathing and doing their best to stay in the present moment. Not an easy task, but well worth practicing periodically throughout the school day. For my third step, encourage your child, or teen in particular, to avoid dealing with frustration by venting. For anyone wondering what venting means, it's essentially a way to express your emotions in a strong and forceful manner. And generally speaking, this has been thought to be a positive strategy to express how you feel. And it is, to a point. After that, it can become highly counterproductive. Venting typically involves talking about something frustrating with a lot of negative energy. For instance, let's assume your teen's frustrated about wearing a mask, physical distancing, or being restricted to a cohort. Becoming focused on something negative doesn't help. What can make it worse is someone validating your experience, or said another way, someone strongly agreeing with you. Now, you become more steadfast in your position and more emotional, which just serves to leave you mo feeling more frustrated and more negative. In a 2015 study by Dr. Evangelia Demarudi and Dr. Russell Cropanzano, they found that the more people vented, the worse they felt. And venting not only interfered with their mood and created less satisfaction for the day, but these negative effects extended to the following day as well. So while it's important for your children and teens to identify and express how they feel, you don't want them to get stuck there for too long. Instead, it's better to help them transition to focusing on exploring potential solutions or engaging in acceptance if they're unable to change the situation. For my fourth step, we're going to look at another alternative strategy for dealing with feelings of frustration instead of utilizing venting. This strategy is known as reframing. Reframing involves identifying a thought or situation and looking at it in a different way. And ideally, looking at it in a way where you can find a positive meaning. For example, let's say your child's frustrated about the physical distancing rule. A way to reframe this rule can be to think, well, at least I get to go to school and be around my friends. If it wasn't for this rule, I wouldn't get to see my friends in person. So with this strategy, the goal is to help your child identify how they feel, but instead of focusing on a negative meaning, you help them search for a way to think differently about it. That makes the thought or situation feel less negative, and ideally, more positive. In a 2013 study by Dr. Fluellen and colleagues, they found that thinking about situations differently, also known as reframing, help people to be less anxious in stressful situations. This technique works for anxiety, works for mood, and it can work to help with feelings of frustration as well. For my fifth step, encourage your child or teen to use chunking. Chunking is a strategy that helps you to view time in smaller chunks. Chunking time is a way to make problems feel more manageable which makes it feel more likely that we can deal with challenges successfully. For example, with young children, when they're impatient about an exciting date coming up, it's common to tell them that it's only so many sleeps before it finally happens. So at school, if your child or teen is frustrated or anxious about wearing a mask, they can focus on dealing with a small part of the day, such as just making it until their break, when they can take their mask off for a little while and have a drink and a snack. This approach can feel a lot more manageable as opposed to having your child arrive at school on the first day and think, hmm, I just need to wear a mask and follow all these new rules until the end of the school year in June. Not to mention, chunking time is likely the most appropriate way to deal with change. Because after the first few weeks of doing these things in a different way, habituation will begin to kick in. This means that when you begin to do something new over and over again, it becomes less emotionally impactful. For my sixth and final step, I'd encourage you to use compassion towards your children and teens. There hasn't been a worldwide pandemic to the scale in over 100 years. So our children and teens are experiencing something that we as adults never had to contend with in childhood. The pandemic has altered most facets of their daily lives and is certainly going to alter many aspects of school. So by the end of the school day, especially during the first few weeks, dealing with continuous change will likely be emotionally exhausting for many children and teens. And this can lead to an increase in mental health and behavioral challenges when they finally get home from school. One helpful way to support your children, especially during this initial adjustment phase of returning to school, is to show compassion for what they're going through. In a 2016 study by Dr. Lauren Winchuski and colleagues, they found that understanding someone's feelings is helpful, but it's incomplete 
unless you communicate concern, which is done by showing empathy or compassion. And a simple way to do this is to ask questions or respond in a way that communicates concern, such as, how was your first day? Did it feel strange? I can understand why it'd be frustrating to be with the same students all day long. Yes, that's a long time to have to wear a mask. I can imagine it was frustrating to keep hearing that you need to keep your distance from your friends. Essentially anything you can say or do that communicates genuine concern will be helpful. So to provide a quick recap, first, it's important to help your children to prepare for change by opening their minds to change with a self-affirmation exercise. A self-affirmation exercise can help your child be more accepting of change by showing them how complying with the new change can help them in a meaningful way, such as preventing the spread of the virus to someone they love. Second, encourage your child or teen to periodically use mindfulness throughout the day, but especially during times when they're feeling stressed or overwhelmed. My third step, encourage your child or teen to avoid venting. There's a fine line with this step. You want your child to identify and talk about how they feel, but you don't want them to become focused on being negative for too long. Instead, it's better to help them transition to explore potential solutions or engage in acceptance if they're unable to change the situation. Fourth, use reframing as an alternative strategy for dealing with negative emotions instead of using venting. When your child's struggling with a negative thought or situation related to the changes at school, reframing can help your child to see the thought or situation in a different way. They can make it seem less negative or hopefully see it more positively. For my fifth step, encourage your child or teen to use chunking. Dealing with time in small chunks can make difficult situations seem more manageable, which can make it easier to cope. And for my sixth and final step, I encourage you to show compassion to your children and teens. This is truly a back to school like no other. And coping with this amount of change will leave most children and teens feeling emotionally exhausted at the end of the school day, at least for the first few weeks. Showing compassion by listening and being empathetic to the challenges at school is an important way to support their mental health during this difficult transition. So I hope you found these steps helpful. If you did, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel by clicking the subscribe button below. And if you ring the bell, you'll be notified the next time we release a video. And of course, feel free to like and share the video as well as leave a comment. If you're experiencing challenges implementing these steps, please contact us at Sullivan Associates Clinical Psychology. Thank you for watching.